Hello everyone uh, and welcome to the assessment briefing video for assessment one of BBS 00-3-1 Foundations of Business Communication. Um, so everyone should have access to the assessment brief uh, which is a document which has the written assessment task, uh, some guidance as well as a mark scheme. Uh, and that's a Word document that you'll find on your real show under the assessment and feedback tab. Um, however, this video is not intended to replace the brief, so you still do need to read through that Word document. Um, this is a complimentary briefing video uh, just to expand on uh, some of the things in the brief to give an explanation of what we're expecting, as well as to run through a suggested structure as well. So if we start just by looking at some of the particulars of the assessment itself. Uh, so this is assessment number one of two assessments on this unit. Um, this assessment is worth 40% of your overall grade. Uh, so assessment two is going to be weighed at 60%, whereas this is weighed at 40%. And the word limit for the assessment as a whole, uh, which is quite important because it will have different parts, but as a whole, it should add up to 2,400 words. Um, any assessment within the university, unless it's explicitly stated otherwise, um, there is a plus or minus 10% uh, included. Uh, so you'll be able to go 240 words over the limit, uh, or you'll be able to go 240 words under the limit. But it should be within plus or minus 10% of that word count, 2,400 words uh, overall. You'll also see the unit learning outcomes on the assessment brief, uh, and this is worth just taking a, a quick look at here. Uh, so you'll see there's two distinct learning outcomes. So your assessments are designed to demonstrate that you've achieved the learning outcomes. Uh, we can't pass you on the unit until you've demonstrated you've achieved them. Uh, so the first learning outcome here is about demonstrating your understanding of different management theories, um, including decision making process uh, and strategic management approaches. However, the second learning outcome is focused on your key skills, your own personal and professional skills, uh, your ability to manage uh, the learning process um, and working with not just working alone, but also working with others. Uh, within a team. Uh, so that's something to bear in mind and hopefully we'll put a bit of context to why we're asking you to approach this assessment in the way that we are. So we're going to move on and, and look at what actually needs to be done on this assessment. Uh, so it's a split assessment so we actually have two distinct sections, two distinct parts to, the, uh, to what you're going to be submitting. Uh, so it's a business report and it's a reflection report. So it's a reflective bit of writing as well. Uh, so your report itself is going to be business analysis on McGraw Hill education. Uh, now, that name should be familiar. Uh, that is, in fact, the company that everyone looked at for the practice week. So the work that you have done in the practice week can be carried forward as well. What you can't do is just take group work output that you did. So you can't take bits of your poster and just copy and paste them in. Um, that was work done for a particular task and it's group work as well. Uh, so we, we really want to make sure you're not just picking up and copying and pasting directly from your practice week poster. However, the information sources you found, the points you discovered, the analytical elements that you've learned, all of those things should really make this assessment uh, less daunting because you've already worked on it last week. Uh, so that's the first part and that's going to be in the form of a formal business report. The second part of the assessment is going to be a reflective report on your key skills. Uh, so we're going to tackle these one by one uh, and we're going to first go ahead and look at the formal business report. So that's taking the business analysis portion of the brief. So knowing that the uh, company, so the business case that we're examining uh, is McGraw Hill Education, uh, we have two distinct um, parts of the first task. So you're asked to explore a business problem 
uh, and we're asked to uh, give recommendations or explore the impact of solutions backed by evidence. Um, so this is really the way that you would break down an assessment task. Uh, you identify the key things being asked of you uh, and then you identify what you need in order to achieve that. Uh, so if we look at the first, explore a business problem in the case, well, how do we identify a business problem? First of all, experienced by McGraw Hill Education, are there any tools or methods that we can use to help us do this in an academic manner? Uh, and secondly, the same question. So if we have uh, looking at the impact of possible solutions or strategic solutions, uh, how can we identify possible solutions uh, and particularly ones which are supported by evidence? So we're going to look at ways we can do both of these. So if we look first at exploring a business problem, well, we have information about McGraw Hill Education. You have an information sheet on your brio shows, which you would have got during practice week as well, which contains some links um, and some starting points for your own research. But that information by itself doesn't necessarily give us a very academic understanding. You may read through the information and the problem pops out at you, but is not put into a model or a tool that really helps us evaluate it um, with everything that you've gathered. Uh, so we have our environmental analysis tools. So we have SWOT, uh, we have Pestel and we have Porters um, and you have guidance videos on all of those if you want to understand how they should be used. So you can take your research that you've done, uh, put it into these models uh, and get a way of understanding, identifying and exploring a particular business problem being faced by uh, by McGraw Hill Education. It's worth pointing out here that you are asked explicitly about a business problem. So tools like Pestel and SWOT and even Porters can give you lots of positive information as well, but we're not asking you to uh, explore and have a lengthy discussion on all of the strengths or positive uh, um, uh, potential scenarios for the uh, company at hand, but rather a business problem, of which there are quite a lot as well. If we look at the second part here, so looking at the impact of the solutions, uh, which are supported by evidence, uh, well, you have lots of potential areas uh, to look here. Uh, so once you've identified the business problem, you can look into both the academic textbooks and journal articles uh, to understand in this situation, when a company is facing this kind of issue, uh, what are the possible strategic solutions? What are the possible courses of action uh, that a company can take? Uh, the key thing to understand here is that the assessment brief explicitly asks for strategic solutions. So we're not looking for operational solutions. The distinction between the two really is in the level of detail. Uh, strategic solutions and strategy is looking for big picture items, really. So the direction of the organization, how the organization relates to its external environment, uh, how the organization sees itself in, you know, one, three, five years time, uh, rather than operational recommendations which are very much looking at specific detailed processes and particular day-to-day -day activities. So you're not being asked for detailed day-to-day -day solutions, operational solutions, you're being asked for strategic solutions, so big picture, long-term solutions. As well as going into the academic literature through the use of journal articles through Discover or academic textbooks, of which we have lots available as online textbooks um, for obvious reasons, uh, you also have credible websites which you can use. Now, I do have to caution you here that credible websites doesn't necessarily mean what you think it means. It doesn't mean websites that have good information that you are found and you want to use. It means websites that you actually have a degree of trust in. Websites that actually present convincing evidence because they themselves are a credible source of information. So if you're looking at things like Wikipedia, Investopedia, Businessballs.com, Dictionary.com, all of which 
are used a lot in student work. These are not credible websites um, for different reasons. But the overall thing is do not go for these kinds of websites. Uh, Wikipedia is absolutely wonderful as a repository of knowledge. I do think that it's a, a wonderful example of pooled human knowledge. Um, however, anybody uh, can edit Wikipedia. Edits are either anonymous or quite often they're through pseudonyms. So we don't actually know who is providing that information. It could be someone who is an expert in that area or it could just be someone with no real understanding who wants to, you know, edit an entry. Uh, so that's a key reason we know, but, you know, we don't use Wikipedia for any academic work. There should be no citations for Wikipedia at all. Same thing goes for Investopedia as well. That often pops up. And again, not a source that we want to use. Uh, websites like businessboards.com not very credible. They're not really backed by any real um, evidence-based presentation information, but rather just definitions of terms which depend on the authors. Again, very few of which are actually identified. I've put dictionary.com on here because it's a, a, a really common thing to cite, um, especially amongst first-year students, when they want to define a term. Defining a term is brilliant, but you have lots of resources to do so. Uh, you have Credo, which is a university uh, database, which is fantastic for defining terms. You can define terms through your core textbook and other texts as well. Uh, those are credible places to uh, define a term. Dictionary.com, not so much. It's not really appropriate for academic work that you're citing a definition from dictionary.com instead of this huge wealth of, of uh, peer-reviewed academic credible sources provided through the university website. Uh, so if you want to understand what we do mean by credible websites, well, we do have examples here. Uh, professional websites, uh, so industry websites, as well as websites like the Harvard Business Review. Now you can access Harvard Business Review a few different ways through directly through the website. You can also go through Discover, uh, but it's a very accessible, uh, business-focused uh, publication, which is very credible. Theconversation.com, again, is a website, not a journal or a, an academic uh, 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 publication, but it does have lots of good information, nice accessible articles, great search function, and so on. Uh, credible news sites like Guardian and BBC are absolutely fine. And if you are going to use Wikipedia, then do not cite Wikipedia, but go down to Wikipedia's own citations. So at the bottom of most uh, good Wikipedia pages, you'll find a long list of references. So if you are going to use it, you absolutely shouldn't cite Wikipedia, but you can follow Wikipedia's own citation. So if they have some credible citations, you can follow those links and then cite those links instead. Right, so next we're just going to take a look at a suggested outline for your business report. So this is still, we're talking about the first part of the assessment brief, the uh, uh, the analysis of your, your business analysis of McGraw Hill Education. Uh, now this is a suggested uh, uh, structure, but it's, it's one which is part of the formal report structure. So it is strongly recommended. Um, you are always going to start off in any uh, report with a title page. Now, your title page has to include, at minimum, your student number, uh, which you can find on your student ID cards, uh, your uh, uh, the assessment number, which is assessment 1, and the unit code, which is BBS003-1. Uh, and that's it, really. At minimum, it has to have those bits of information. Um, then on the next page, you have an executive summary. Uh, now, you have to get used to writing an executive summary. It's a, a, a really integral part of the business report format, but it only needs to do two things. Uh, so it needs to summarize the purpose of your report. So what's the purpose or the premise of your report? And secondly, it has to give an indication of what your key findings are. So it's not an introduction. 
you write it after you finish the entirety of your report. So the convention for an executive summary in terms of length is that it's placed on its own page uh, and it should be about two paragraphs or half a page, whichever is shorter. Uh, so it's a short, concise summary of the premise of your report and an indication of what the key findings of your report are. So it's something that you would want to leave until after you've finished a report to write. The next page should be your table of contents. Um, now, this might sound obvious, but just in case it's worth pointing out that all of your pages should be numbered uh, and then you can create a table of contents quite easily through Word's built-in tools. It may take you uh, half an hour or so, but I would recommend playing around with Word's headings and uh, built-in tools for creating a table of contents, uh, just so you can learn how to do so easily and quickly. The next page is where your report content really begins. Uh, so you have your introduction. So in the introduction, you should explain what you're going to do in the report, what the purpose of the business report is. You want to give any background or context to the report that you feel is needed for the reader, uh, as well as any definitions. If you're going to be repeatedly using some key terms, the introduction is a good place to give your definition of those key terms. Uh, but for a report like this, you're looking at something relatively short. You're just explaining uh, what you're going to be doing in the report as well as any of the, the definitions or so on that you feel are necessary. Uh, and then we move on to section A, which is the first part of our main body. Uh, so here you uh, need to give a summary of the case study. So the information that you found about McGraw-Hill education that you think is relevant and important. So obviously this needs to be cited. Uh, everything in the report that you found from other sources uh, needs to have references and citations. Uh, but in this section, you will be presenting a nice, concise overview of the uh, case itself, of the business case. Um, and the information that you found on the business case. The next section of the main body, uh, section B, is going to be your exploration of the business problem. Uh, this is where you're going to bring in uh, SWOT analysis, Pestel, Porters, whatever you've used to identify and explore the, uh, the business uh, and its environment, uh, as well as in your own words, exploring the actual issue that you've identified. Uh, so this is the, the real core, the heart of the uh, response to the first part of the assessment brief. Uh, we are asked to identify and explore an issue. Uh, once you have done so, you can move on and look at the second part, which is looking at the impact of potential strategic solutions. Uh, which should be supported by published academic research. So this is where you'd bring in information you found from journal articles, bring in uh, information you found from academic textbooks as well uh, to explore what potential solutions they are to the business problem you've identified and explored in section B. So there should be a clear connection between sections A B and C. In section A, you're laying out the uh, the business case, you're laying out the uh, information you found about McGraw-Hill, so you're placing your report into its broader context. Uh, then you're moving on and using uh, tools like SWOT analysis, like Pestel, like Porter's Vive Forces, uh, to identify and explore a particular business problem or issue facing uh, McGraw-Hill education. And then in section C, you're looking at potential strategic solutions to the issue you've identified and explored previously. Uh, so there should be a clear connection between all three of those sections. Then you'd move on to your conclusion. So here, what we just need to do is summarize the key points uh, into a nice overview uh, to wrap up and place your uh, your the findings of your report uh, within its proper context. Uh, so a conclusion should never have any new information. Uh, it should never have any new arguments or new recommendations. Uh, you're just concluding. You're just summarizing what's come before. Uh, 
Uh, and then lastly, you'd have your reference list. Uh, now, you should be familiar with referencing. If you're not, there is lots of information on the Brio shell about referencing. You also have a, a section on the library website, which is lrweb.beds.ac.uk. Um, so we need to use the Harvard UOB referencing style. So that requires in-text citations as well as a uh, longer full reference list. So anytime you've used an in-text citation, that should be coupled with a longer entry in the reference list itself. So please, if you're not familiar with Harvard referencing, uh, you need to go to the library website or use any of the resources on the unit's Brio shell to familiarize yourself with, uh, with referencing. In terms of the word count itself, uh, not everything in a business report format counts as part of your word count. So here we have everything from the introduction to the conclusion. So the conclusion isn't highlighted, it should have been. Uh, so is introduction, sections A, B and C and your conclusion. Uh, all of those will be within the word count. Your title page, your executive summary, table of contents, and your reference list are all excluded from the word count. Okay, so that's our overview of what needs to be done for the business analysis section of the report. Uh, oh, sorry, of the assessment. You also have a reflective report that you need to do as well. So we're just going to pull out some of the key terms and talk about what needs to be done for the reflective report. Uh, so this is just as important as the business analysis section uh, and this should be included after your business report in the same document but uh, placed afterwards. So just to emphasize what a reflection is and isn't, uh, a reflection is not just a description of what you've done. So we're not just looking for you to describe the activities or the work that you've done on the unit so far. We are looking for an actual reflection. So looking for some insight, looking for evidence that you've considered what was challenging, what was straightforward, uh, what you enjoyed doing, what you didn't enjoy doing, how it challenged your existing knowledge or how it fitted in with your existing knowledge, as well as how you could apply what you've learned in the future, either in your future uh, uh, work on the course or in the future in terms of your own professional careers. Uh, so that's what we're looking for in terms of a reflection. We're not just looking for a description of the things that you've done on the unit so far. Um, this again shouldn't be starting from scratch so you should have been keeping learning journals from weeks one to five so you should be keeping journal entries or writing journal entries uh, throughout your time on the unit so you can directly base this part of the assessment on those learning journal entries uh, you can explore communication numeracy ict problem solving and working with others these are the key skills that you're developing during this unit um, so this is a part of really reflecting on the workshops and the activities that are taking part uh, uh, that are taking place during your classes uh, as well as your independent work outside of the class as well. You can bring in theories that you've covered so far in the unit, such as Balbin, Tuckman and Kolb. Um, Balbin particularly useful for reflecting on your own um, personal development of skills and what your strengths are. Tuckman particularly useful for looking at group working. So you should have been working in groups during your practice activity, for example, uh, so Tuckman is a useful way of understanding group dynamics and how group work uh, uh, occurs. Uh, you need to write your uh, report in, oh, sorry, your reflective report in the first person, uh, and you should be linking back your discussion on key schools development to the appropriate journal entry. Uh, so this little citation saying, you know, if you have uh, discussed ICT skills in journal entry week three, uh, when you discuss that in your reflective report, you should be uh, putting a little citation in there to your, uh, you know, journal entry week three, for example, uh, just to link that section to uh, your journal entry that you made during week three. So hopefully that gives you a sense of what you need to do for your reflective report again you've got a longer text description in the assessment brief uh, but we are looking for an honest reflection 
what you're not expected to do is write that everything was really easy and then you found it really straightforward and you're really fantastic at you know problem solving and working with others um, that's not the way to get a fantastic mark for a reflection uh, we're looking for honest reflection identifying areas where you could improve looking at ways that you have improved ways that you've grown and learned skills during activities uh, and during work done on the unit so honest reflection trying to understand your learning process is the way to get a high grade uh, not to say that you know you excelled in everything everyone has areas where they need to develop everyone has areas where they can improve and that's what we're looking for uh, more than anything else and lastly, just to take a look at the mark scheme. So please do look at the mark scheme on the assessment brief. Uh, it's a uh, it's going to be at the very end of the assessment brief, and it will give examples of what will score highly and what will score less highly. Um, but what I just want to draw your attention to uh, is the way that the marks are broken down. So if you understand how you're going to be marked, that gives you a good idea of how to go about writing the assessment itself. Uh, so 10% of your overall mark for this assessment is going to come from your introduction and the summary of the business case itself. Uh, so this is very much in both your introduction of your report, but also of section A, uh, where you uh, give an introduction and summary to the business case to McGraw-Hill Education. Uh, so finding good high quality information, presenting it in a nice concise manner, clearly laying out what you're going to do in the business report. All of these things will contribute to getting a good mark for this section. 20% of your overall marks are going to be given for evidence of understanding and application of relevant theories, case evaluation and key findings. So what this should tell you is that you really do need to make sure you bring in academic theory, uh, that you don't just have a general discussion if you have a general discussion without using uh, relevant theory so again uh, things like pastel and porter's five forces are the kinds of theories here as well as uh, your reflection theories of tuckman and so on uh, those very much need to be present to get a good grade uh, the strength of your evaluation of the business case as well as your key findings so how you bring in the academic literature how you present your discussion of the impact of potential strategic solutions that will tie into this section as well uh, 30 percent is going to be awarded on your reflective report so your reflection report and how you're reflected on the learning in the unit and how well you're presented your reflection on your key skills development and other areas 30% on your online journal content and quality. So similar, but looking at your weekly journal entries uh, and how you're reflected on your week by week activities in the unit. Uh, and lastly, we have 10% for how you've structured your assessment, uh, how you've presented, so nice professional presentation, as well as the quality of the referencing, spelling and grammar. Right, hopefully this has been of, uh, of some help in understanding your assessment please make sure you read the assessment brief carefully as well. Uh, and please do ask your unit coordinator uh, if you have any further questions or queries also.